a playlist original. This is a magic ticket. What would you do? I'm in the movie. Who the heck are you? Don't shoot me. I'm a kid. If you could join your favorite hero on the big screen. Yes. And what would he do? If I go, how do I get back? If you brought him to the real world. Things were different here. Darn it, that hurt. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Everybody down. Last action hero, rated PG-13. The fun begins on June 18th. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to Back to the Blockbuster Presents Deep Dives, where we talk about some of your favorite movies, or maybe some movies you may have forgotten about. Uh, we have another repeat guest on today. I'm just going to get it out the way. Uh, Dustin Rick is back uh, with us for the third time. Um, but uh, with this uh, visit comes a little bit more uh, information behind it because uh, you guys responded very favorably um, to the episodes that we did together. The first one was Collateral. And then uh, the second one was Batman Mask of the Phantasm. And um, while I appreciate, we appreciate you listening to us on all the your podcast outlets. Uh, we have really gone behind good pods a lot because they, um, they're a great source for independent podcasts. And they really push those shows to the forefront. Like they have all the, the popular main shows on their app, but on their main page, you'll only find uh, independent podcasts that, you know, don't have all the, backing that a big show would have uh to promote their stuff and you guys uh actually made batman master the phantasm i believe the week a little over a week that it came out for us on good pods top 100 uh shows any category any category it went up to like number six or seven somewhere in there so it rated pretty high uh for us and uh and i think it's our right now our third most successful deep dive and uh it's good to be in the top three. So I was like, all right, with that information, uh, with those stats, and also with the conversation uh, always going so well, I pitched to Dustin. I was like, hey, like I know you have your own show and your own stuff to do, but would you like to be on more often? And um, he was down to be more on more often. So what's going to happen is there will be other podcast guests on, same as always. The, the show will still feature uh, – different uh guests who are picking the movies uh for us to deep dive but um dustin won't be like a permanent host but we'll just call him a frequent correspondent of films <laughs> <laughs> on the deep dive <laughs> so, 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 yeah. so that's what we're gonna go with <laughs> so yeah we'll yeah back, and we'll come back uh welcome back more often uh on the deep dive show Oh man, I'm totally, I'm totally stoked, and 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 honestly, I'm totally honored for for the offer, and you know, I, y- you know how much I fucking love and respect, you know what you do, but not only what you guys do for for the mu- the the movie community, like, you know, it's a, it's a tricky it's a tricky tightrope walk because we know how fanboys can get, and then on on the other side, there's like very loving, and and so I've always been a fan of of what you guys are doing and now to be a more regular frequent part of it. I mean, I'm totally fucking honored. So thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, it was fun. I mean, speaking of fanboy nitpicky, uh, there, I mean, there wasn't bad nitpicky stuff about the Batman episode. It was more <laughs> like, you know, they were happy that we touched on certain things like, mm-hmm. uh, with certain voice actors and certain scenes like, Oh yeah, I'm so glad you talked about that. Or you better. I talked about that. Or yeah, it was, it was very, yeah, very much. Uh, it's hard. And I told Dustin offline like we did uh, an anniversary episode for Batman '89 that I'm afraid to let any everyone here, but it'll still be fun. Uh, <laughs> guess knowing that everyone has strong opinions, but like cool thing is like they can have strong opinions, you know, in the negative way, and like you just deal with that. And they also can have it in a very positive way, and that works out with this. Like the episodes that Dustin's was that he was featured on were well received by people that listen to them, and. Um, uh, you know what? With Jackson, when he became, uh, even though Dustin's not going to be a like, permanent co-host of this show, when Jackson, uh, a little over a year ago, was a guest on Back to the Blockbuster as mm-hmm. a guest co-host, mm-hmm. um, he had like, one episode, and I was I was supposed to have like other guest hosts on, and I did finish out the year with like five more people. But before I finished out that year, I had already reached out to Jackson. I was like, do you want to do this permanently? And, uh, you know, all signs pointed that to that not working because uh, 
Jackson lives all the way in New Brunswick, Canada. I've never uh, met I've never met Jackson in person, but I've never met you in person either. But um, well, not yet. It'll uh, happen. Yeah, there was a lot. There was a lot of uh, a lot. Of my friends were just like, "Oh, why would you offer that to him when you haven't even met him? He doesn't live in the area." Right. But um, it's been about a, almost a year and a half now with Jackson on the show, and now most of the people that listen to it myself included and fans that listen to it can't imagine it without him so like that was a uh decision that was made kind of hoping for the best and it worked yeah. out so yeah. so i went with my gut went with my gut there i went with my gut here so i think it'll work out uh just fine uh and i think it works out with your schedule too just popping in a little bit more frequently but sure. not too much to, not too much to overwhelm you and um i'm just more excited for all the movies that you you plan on throwing my direction yeah uh, <laughs> because they've they've all been so different so far so far um and yeah. um but, but that's exciting about it uh i think with you you'll cover a lot of different genres and all that too that's in, that's also exciting you don't have like one particular type of movie that you always want to talk about it seems like you're willing to yeah it, which is yeah. important well i mean yeah no i and and <clears throat> you know i said i said this to you before we started recording but i think I don't know if it's my goal, but I, I would like to paint you and I into very difficult corners and then see <laughs> how see how we can then escape that. Because I think the people who listen to this or watch this on YouTube, right, they're not a dumb audience. Cle clearly, they're very, very smart. They're smarter than I am with, with films. I love films and pop culture, but I think they deserve to be entertained and like challenged so like let's let's drop ourselves to the bottom of the ocean in some houdini chains and try to like wiggle out of that <laughs> by the end by the end of the episode right and see what we yeah. can come come up with and i think i mean you know collateral that's not a that's not an easy one and like neither is mask of the phantasm and to go from collateral yeah. to mask of the phantasm and we're the gonna jump. do it we're gonna do <laughs> we're, we're about to take a really big jump here and you know, I apologize to everybody. It's not Vanilla Sky. <laughs> I was gonna say something about that. I was, I, it, it's not, guys. But I think now that he's on more regularly, yeah, it'll it, happen. That that will happen. Yeah. Uh, we should do like a big special or something uh, yeah, officially yeah. for Vanilla Sky because that's a lot to unpack to. Uh, yeah, uh, that's a long episode. Yeah. Uh, uh yeah, but um, oh, I guess it's time to tell people what what corner did you paint us into uh yeah for, for this episode <laughs> yeah so i have taken us all the way back to 1993 uh a, a little film a little film called last action hero starring arnold schwarzenegger and um an unknown child actor uh and 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 a, and a, and a ton of cameos um yeah. stay stay with us here because this thing it, it, it is a beast. This thing is a monster in terms of what it was supposed to be, what it wound up being, and then now how it's kind of finding this cult-like status very, very slowly. Um, yep. and, and I have some hot take opinions, like always. It took, so It took some time. Um, and the unknown child actor, who I also thought was unknown, but uh, he looked familiar. So I was like, I was like, who is this kid? And um, I guess he he was in Lawnmower Man, the movie I remember watching as a oh, kid. Oh yeah, horror movie back in the day, and he's in My Girl Two, which is not as good as My Girl One. So you'll be a uh, you'll be yeah. it's okay if you forgot about My Girl Two. So um, <laughs> and then I guess he was on a CBS drama called Promised Land that was on for three seasons. It looks like he has stopped acting and is focused on being a photographer. Uh, and it's now forty three years old. So I, this is always weird when I because I see like these people like frozen yeah. in time in movies. And since I have not seen Austin O'Brien uh, since around, at least since the late 90s, he is still around this age or a little older. So the fact that he's 43 now and my brain is, uh, yeah, makes my brain hurt. Yeah, <laughs> it bit. does. No, it really, really <laughs> does. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, that makes sense because now I can see the kid from Lawnmower Man. He's yeah. He almost plays like the same character in both Lawnmower Man. Yeah, and, and, he's and, very <laughs> precocious. Very, yeah. very precocious, this one. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was the vibe I was getting from it. Um, I, I was, you know, I at first when you picked it, because I'm like, my thing is, no matter what anyone picks on here, I'm going to go with it. Um, mm -hmm. It's not my, um, There's, I don't think it's my place to be like, no, that's not going to work. Because like, I think it's the, well, in the episode, it's, our job to try to make it work even if sure. it is 
you know, and, you know, originally when we had a regular co-host on this show, it seemed like we were just picking smaller movies that people had like kind of forgotten about a bit. And yeah. I'm glad that I'm glad that it's more of a mix of uh, we can we can do a bit of a bigger film, too. Mm-hmm. And then also, uh, in this case, a movie that was intended to be big, but uh, definitely uh wasn't at the time, but yeah. that you're but you're right. It became it has uh, developed a cult following. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger said thanks to its streaming and all that stuff um, over the last few years. Um, if you watch his uh, documentary on Netflix, he specifically talked about this movie <laughs> failing. This movie failing and how it uh, really affected him in a really negative way. Because mm-hmm. I think this is probably considered, even though in the '80s he had some movies that. No, they all did relatively well, but I think this is like his first true financial, what mm-hmm. they would call financial disaster, based around based on its budget and what it was intended to make, and all that. Which is you know, which is why it's so, it's so funny. I, I got pitched a feature to write for a movie web about because uh, True Lies' anniversary is coming up July fifteenth, his thirtieth. Oh yeah, and, and they pitched me being like, oh well, can you write something along the lines of Arnold Schwarzenegger's career was saved or not career, but was uh, he needed a box office hit basically because a year before he had one of his biggest bombs. And that's how I have to kind of write around that. And it's basically focusing <laughs> on how last action hero was a huge bomb. And then true lives was a huge hit and uh, kind of gave him back a little bit of his box office credit after. And it's so crazy. Cause it was like one, it's one flop um, after a yeah. string of hits. I mean, like he did Terminator two before last action hero. So I guess, so I guess the, the issue there is, on the one hand, we should be like, "Yo, we did Terminator 2. That, I mean, that was a, that was the most successful movie, one of the most successful movies of that year worldwide. Mm-hmm. He can we we can give him a flop. Or I guess the other one is it. We were expecting more from you because oh yeah, Terminator 2 did so well. Yeah, and this should have done well too. Um, I read that they positioned this movie as the action movie of the summer. It was supposed to, and I, I don't know how they thought that because Jurassic Park was right there. It opened a week before this. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that was another, I guess, bone of contention of a, when they released it. Yeah. I don't, how they, I don't know how they didn't like see the power of Steven Spielberg and dinosaurs. <laughs> at that yeah. Time, but... <laughs> I mean, it, but like, yeah. I mean, like to, to paint a picture, like you just, you just set us up to, right? So Arnold had been on this increase. Like you said, some of the movies in the 80s weren't big, but they were building, they were building, they were building. And then he did Terminator right. and then he did Predator and then and then eventually Terminator 2. And like we all know Terminator 2. I mean, how many times did you see Terminator 2 in the fucking theater? I, 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 I yeah. Kid, I remember a lot, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I would say for me, because back then we had this thing called dollar theater. So in the normal theater, yep. I would say 10 times. Right. And then in the dollar theater, a- another six, at least. Right. Like yep. th- just so many times because it just was that good. It felt like summer. It smelled like summer. That to me was my first sort of summer blockbuster action, f- action film. And so that was the pinnacle. And, you know, he could do no wrong because, the guy's the fucking Terminator, and he and he just, <laughs> I mean, that thing, that thing just went. It was a long time for it even, you know, turned up on home video because it was just so. It would just kept generating money, money, uh, you know, yeah. whatever, and it was one, yeah, and so for a long time, sure, and yeah. and I, I know he had a lot of offers to do a lot of things, and 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 you know, he had done Twins with Danny DeVito and kind of flexed his comedic chops a bit, and I think this one was set up to sort of be the the next big action film with Arnold Schwarzenegger two summers later. Right. And I think he wanted to sort of, sort of, sort of make fun of himself, but still with an action picture to do so. And so that's where we, we, we get last action hero. And, you know, there was a huge line of action figures and I actually had them because as a kid, when you see Terminator two, anything with Arnold, I mean, I remember like watching kindergarten cop only because of Terminator two. Right. And so like, I remember the action figures came out like, um, you know, a month before last action hero, I remember having a few of those and like the, the I, th- I think there might've been like a, a car or something then or whatever. Like I had those fucking, and I was really excited. And I mean, again, I'm a, in 93, I'm a, I'm a fucking kid. And so I no. saw this thing in a the theater 
And I mean, I didn't, I, I thought what was so cool about it and, 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 and the main reason that I want to, wanted to bring it to us to, to dive into it was because this, this movie, I was so entranced that this kid in the plot, you know, he, he, uh, there's a projectionist in an old rundown movie theater, very rundown, by the way. I don't know how yeah. they're operating still, but, but <laughs> this kid like doesn't have a family. He's in, there's homeless people sleeping in the theater, but, um, yeah. he is obsessed with this character, Jack Slater, that's played by Arnold Schwarzenegger. And, um, the projectionist invites him to a screening uh, just him and this old man, which is weird, but okay. And he he has this magic golden ticket from Harry Houdini that allows this kid to then enter the the, the movie, right? So for yeah. me, we're in a culture of movies now where it's all multiverse. Everything is meta, right? You've got um, you know, Deadpool and She Hulk and all the people who can break the fourth wall. Yeah, this this movie in 1993 was a multiverse sorry. meta kind of thing. And and listen, I'm just going to drop it right here in the in the at, the at the at the top of the episode. But like, I don't think again, controversial. Here we go. Dustin's takes. But like, <laughs> I don't think we have a Deadpool breaking the fourth wall without Last Action Hero. That's that's my take. Yeah, I mean, it was it was meta before meta was cool. Yeah. Uh, and and uh and just to like uh just so people fully understand because like, the plot is a little bit of a mouthful but it shows how <laughs> meta the movie actually is first of all it was directed by john mctiernan who already works with arnold schwarzenegger and the predator so i think yeah. that was another thing that was like oh let's reunite those two we got mm -hmm. yeah got something cooking there and, and like said, also directed die hard yeah also so you have like a a big action director uh no. doing this and then you it's co-written by shane black who is also uh known in that industry as well uh, being associated with like the lethal weapon movies and stuff like that as well too yeah yeah uh, but i know this was a uh now zach penn i guess wrote the early version of this movie that was far different apparently from what like the yeah. rewrites were they said there were a ton of script doctors that came in and changed some stuff uh zach penn uh said that the movie was so different that he almost didn't want his name on it. So they settled for a story by him and another writer. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, but what we got was a, uh, it's a satire of action uh, of the action genre and associated cliches. Uh, Star Wars, Schwarzenegger as Jack Slater, a Los Angeles police detective within the Jack Slater action film franchise. While Austin O'Brien co-stars as Danny Madigan, a boy magically transported into the Slater universe and Charles Dance is Mr. Benedict, a ruthless assassin from the Slater universe who escapes to the real world. So there's a lot going on there. And even <laughs> and even and, and even the description of it sounds like what we would think of as, you know, the kind of multiverse stories we're getting from yeah. the Marvel movies and DC universe right now. Um, I will say, I think when this came out, it was a little early and people weren't really understanding all the... Sure. Well, I don't want to call people stupid. They were like, but it just wasn't there. The type of humor, I mean, it's very like, and this, and since it's a Hollywood movie, it's very much like industry, almost insider kind of jokes and all that mm -hmm. stuff too. So, like, a lot of people say that films about Hollywood tend to not do that well sometimes because sure. pe people watching it seem like they're outside of it. I mean, the Fall Guy kind of experienced that a little bit earlier this summer, where I thought it was a good movie and it's a fun action movie, but there were a lot of inside movie jokes that they think <clears throat> flew over people's heads. Um, but yeah, you get this in 90, 1993 and 94, you get Wes Craven's New Nightmare, which is also did the movie within the movie mm -hmm. uh, thing, too. I think the meta stuff starts to make more sense to people once you get to scream. And I think it's probably because they didn't sure. force force it too much there. It was just it was just enough that and that was geared at a younger audience who was probably ready to accept sure. uh, more intelligent humor like that. So uh, I know some people don't like the whole it was ahead of its time uh, debate. Sure. But I think this movie was, and I hadn't watched it in a very, very long time. So my last, my last uh, response to this movie, because it was that long ago, I just remember not thinking much of it because I thought of it a bit differently than, yeah. but looking at it now in the current Hollywood landscape and the movies that are coming out uh, that are similar, that kind of poke fun at mm -hmm. themselves and stuff like this. 
um, it really was ahead of its time. And I agree with Arnold Schwarzenegger that it could be one of the more underrated movies of his uh, filmography, but it's finding an audience more so now than it did in 1993. So Yeah. And, you know, look, the, the, the film itself is about a kid who has, has, he doesn't ha have, I, I forget if it's a dad, he doesn't have parents. I think he lives in like some foster, some, something's going on with the kid. He doesn't, he has a really shitty life, right? Yeah. He lives in a crime ridden area of New York city. Oh well, yeah. With his widowed mother, Irene. And right. His father's and his father's dead. So yeah. yeah. So he, so good, good way to start the movie. <laughs> exactly. But I mean, the larger, the larger point, I think the thing that really resonated with me, and I think everybody listening to this, watching this is going to be like, Oh, okay, wait a minute. The idea that this kid to escape his trauma goes to uh, a skanky, gross <laughs> movie movie theater to watch Jack Slater films. He knows the lines, just like we all knew the lines at T2. He's the only one in the yeah. theater watching the movie. There's a bunch of bums sleeping, whatever. But he goes every day, right? He goes every day. He knows yeah. the projectionist by name. The projectionist is named Nick, for, for, all, for all of yeah. you who are wondering, right? But I think the larger theme <laughs> of this is, is that, you know, we all look to to movies to escape our trauma whether it's the trauma of the day or the trauma from our childhood or our divorce or whatever it is you're going through right I mean people at night no. they'll put they'll put on friends and they'll they know that that world isn't real but while they're watching that it's comforting enough to picture them in the, on those perfectly lined streets with whatever in the characters and 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 so i mean even if you look at something and this is where I think a lot of people miss the brilliance of, of WandaVision, but Wanda Maximoff in that in that universe, uh, in that show, was so traumatized by the death of her her loved one that her mental break uh, caused her to create uh, comfort television shows to make yeah, herself or feel just make herself feel better. All of us as humans are are doing that. We have something we watch that that brings our nerves down, and we look at ourselves inside of that particular world, whether it's friends or whether it's the Marvel universe or or action movies, or a lot of people do it with horror movies, right? And I totally understand that. And so what I think is groundbreaking about Last Action Hero um, is that this poor kid who's clearly traumatized by the death of his father and this horrible neighborhood he lives in that goes to this really crappy school, he's going to the theater by himself to escape and whatever. And what happens? He gets a magic ticket and he gets to go inside of that universe. It's, it's basically like if you were to enter grand theft auto, you know, if you're going, <laughs> if you're going to go into GTA five, the skies are sunny. There's bad guys everywhere, but you can't really die. Right. He yeah, goes into, yeah. he goes right into that world where he can't be hurt. And he, and he, he sort of gets to play around in that. I mean, there's guns and dynamite and bombs and they're jumping out of, you know, skyscrapers and falling into pools and all of the things. And it's safe. Right. And I think the movie works the best when they're in the movie universe, the movie within the movie and the Slater yeah. Slater Slaterverse, where I think it kind of loses its cool and they should have saved it for the sequel is the bad guys then entering our world. I think that's where it kind of, because, you know, Jack Slater actually meets Arnold Schwarzenegger and it's really messy, you know, <laughs> and, and the bad guys in this, I thought were co really corny, but really cool. Yeah. Um, I think I'm glad that you said that because I, um, the movie is long. It's a, it's a 131 minutes, which is long for this kind of movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, but a movie this long may not feel long. If uh, narratively it flows well, I think once uh bad guy enters like the real world, it makes the movie feel longer. Uh, yeah. it, it almost, it almost feels like its own separate uh, film as if, as if you are watching a sequel a little bit or a follow up to what you've just been watching. Yeah. So it makes it feel like a, a tad too long. So that, that was like one complaint I had about it was the length. And then I was thinking, I think also beyond the meta satire stuff, I think tonally uh, the film had a hard time figuring out what it wanted to be. And I think that might have been a tough sell during the summer of 1993, because yeah. I think anytime you have a child protagonist, it's like, oh, is this made for kids or is this made for adults? Uh, right. 
not not sure who it's made for. And I think the movie, a lot of times, isn't quite sure. Uh, which can explain uh, all the script doctors and everyone that did a run through of the screenplay. Probably all that mismatch of people probably created this like tonal mess at the time. What looked like a tonal mess at the time. Yeah, because um, it is hard to tell like what who what audience it was really made for or intended for. Um, and I still kind of struggled that when it was over because there was stuff in the movie that felt, oh, like a child would love this. Like you mentioned all the stuff about like I, what kid wouldn't want to like jump into their favorite movie and uh, experience that. So like, yeah. that aspect of it feels like it's almost a kid's film. But then there's other aspects of it that are a bit that feel a little bit more adult. Uh, some of the jokes would fly over a child's head. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so it, you know, it was, I think, kind of, uh, tonally bipolar if you will at times where i was like i can't tell like what audience this was made for (laughs) no totally and i i think you're you're dead on with that because i think what that was from what i understand from what i read about it is that they kept questioning is this too much this is this not enough this and so you know i think schwarzenegger came to it with the enough humility to, to say like let's make fun of me right Let, let's make fun of yeah. these movies and, and that was cool of him to do that and very very smart but then there are pieces of it that feel and it should be over the top but there's pieces of it that feel so over the top that it's almost into naked gun territory like yeah. you know Full there's this, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then there's other pieces of it where you know him and the kid well for instance the the naked gun thing right so he's on the <laughs> then this is just like spaghetti ready for this because I'll, I'll get i'm going to give a good example of like how all over the place it is <laughs> there's a villain called the the river the ripper or the rooftop ripper and he's like yeah. this disfigured guy with an axe and he has actually kidnapped jack slater arnold schwarzenegger's character's son and um and a bunch of other kids on the rooftop and he's like you know throw out your gun jack and so schwarzenegger throws out his gun and he's like really only one gun and then for the next like 40 seconds it's him removing gun after gun after gun after gun after gun from his pocket his hip his whatever he's got a knife in there there's a fake grenade that feels very naked gun but then followed like right after that Jack Slater's son is killed. <laughs> like the little boy, yeah, 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 yeah. the little boy dies, really right? Don't. And so, <laughs> I mean, I, I spent my summers like jumping into a pool, pretending that I was, you know, Martin Riggs from from Lethal Weapon, like falling out of a building, like you know, and 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 there is that sort of fantastical. We get to enter this world through this kid's eyes element to it, and that works. But then I think what you brought up that doesn't work is the is the it's trying it doesn't know what it is and that's sort of what harms it but even that i think could have we could have let that slide if they wouldn't if they would have saved the bad guys coming it should have been about getting this kid back and yeah, making making world. making him more confident and you know you know jack slater can be a father figure to him but he's got to go back to his world you got to go back to yours the the second yeah. that 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 jack slater because it takes away the fun of us living in that world all of a sudden now we're back in our grimy violence yeah. violence counts you know like it's like you play grand theft auto and the, the fun part is it's just to like shoot a bunch of hookers and drive over and, a bunch of old people and right no one gets hurt <laughs> and no one gets hurt <laughs> yeah <laughs> so when he starts getting hurt in the film when it becomes real um and I literally just on the spot thought of of my next film that I'm going to suggest. Oh, man, it, it's a good one, um, but it, it 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 ends our fun because now people are really bleeding, people are really hurting, and there's no and there's no more fun. The bad guys are fucking up, you know. Or we're we're gonna take this world over, whatever. Like, you know, there's a whole thing about him like going around and bringing other bad guys from films like Jason like into into no. into the real world that could have been a that could have been an incredible sequel but that goes way off into a different direction yeah uh and i think too if the if the maybe if there was more focus in the screenplay there could have been some really good uh story stuff there about mm-hmm. uh separating fact from fiction and why you know yeah. you can have this suspension of disbelief when you're watching a movie and the consequences of what's real versus what's fake 
there could have been a lot of stuff that would that could have been really well written there and i don't yeah. think the screenplay takes the time to touch on that because i like you said like you do go from this fun kind of whimsical like yeah. i can get shot and not get hurt thing yeah. and then all of a sudden it's real and now yeah you said people are bleeding people are getting hurt and yeah maybe they didn't maybe they didn't want to force feed that message but there i think there's something that could have been really well done with the especially having the kid at the center of that and yeah. like learning that true lesson of you know separating you know fact from fiction mm -hmm. and you know make believe in real life i think there's a uh like i said i feel like there's like a, a bunch of different movies in one here that could have yeah. all been like well, you know one great movie and uh it's funny because Shane Black basically kind of said that, like he, because he he has denounced the movie. It seemed like entirely, yeah. But he basically said that that there are a lot of images on the screen, a lot of little things that work, but they don't add up to anything that matter. Right. And um, I wouldn't be as harsh as him, but you know he was involved in being part of the creative process, so he's allowed to, I guess, uh, have yeah. his opinion on that in that yeah. way. But <laughs> I, I, you know, I do kind of agree with the part of like there are a lot of good really solid ideas mm -hmm. um that probably could have been fleshed out if so many people weren't involved in the creative process i you know i think uh i think uh zach penn's original script seems like and, and adam left as well um was always meant to parody action films but like it was supposed to be a bit more serious i guess and yeah. and, and uh maybe a little bit more adult throughout uh yeah. and not so uh whimsical apparently uh the whole golden <clears throat> ticket thing that was not zach penn's idea he hated that that was uh, <laughs> that was that was the rewrite but he also wasn't going to provide an explanation as to how uh and he got into the movie so uh, <laughs> i kind of was i i was like well if, if not the golden ticket what would it be like what he fell asleep and he's dreaming like what would have happened to get him yeah in there um uh, yeah, maybe I, I I think he was trying to imply too the golden ticket thing is cheesy and maybe it is, but you need something to explain uh, how this is all happening. And I know some people that don't really want to explain their stories, like let's leave it up to the audience. But like that wasn't one of those moments. Yeah, that you need. I think you needed a, a solid explanation as to how he got there. Yeah, it's a second. fucking yeah. it's a fucking plot point, right? And I think. I love the idea that it came from Houdini because I'm a huge fan of, of of Houdini in that era, and I'm you know. But what doesn't work is that if you know anything about Houdini, he spent a, a good portion of his later years dispelling magic, <laughs> like like trying to prove <laughs> trying to prove that magic wasn't real. So to say yeah. that he had this ticket from Houdini feels kind of weird. Um, but they do, they do need a, a way in, and I think that then becomes. The way in uh you know there is a scene for everything that doesn't work there is a, there's an absolutely brilliant scene yes i'm using brilliant and last action hero in the same <laughs> sentence but there is a scene where it's him and it's schwarzenegger and the kid and i it's one of those scenes where it's like oh no no don't touch that and then they, they both explode like they, bl yep. they they blow up and then it's immediately followed by the kid and schwarzenegger sitting and getting chewed out by the police captain while they're covered in like soot and glass or whatever. <laughs> and it's straight yeah. out a lethal weapon. And it's so funny that this kid <laughs> is that you're, you're feeling it through the kid's eyes. Cause he's seen this yeah. so many times before. And now he's part of it. He's a little freaked out, but as an audience, we pick up on how many times we've seen See the, that ca the captain just chewing out Martin and Riggs right from lethal weapon yeah. and Shane black. I mean, you know, the dude's surgical that he uh, dude, I, uh, you remember last boy scout like basically yep. basically the the lethal weapon that never was i mean yeah. that that movie sounds looks and and i don't care what anybody says about the last boy scout i i fucking love that movie and that's no, another so, another underrated yeah, yeah underrated classic um and so i think those brilliant points is when shane black came in and wrote he had to have written that 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 getting shoot, shoot, shoot out by the captain scene. Yeah. And I, and from what I read, you know, they basically extended a, a hand to Shane black and said, this movie is skewing most your of movies. your movie. So do you want to just come over and, and hang out and write some stuff for it? He's like, sure. You know, but then when it bombed, right, because yeah. you're right, Jurassic park came the weekend before. Um, yeah. And it's a situation that's almost like modern day, you know why i mean why tom cruise wouldn't and paramount wouldn't have moved mission impossible 
you know, away, <laughs> like, dude, release, release Mission Impossible a month earlier, a month later, you know? Yeah. Um, but they did that with this. And I think it was because we've got the Terminator, right? We've got Schwarzenegger. It's an action movie. It, it it's not it's not R it's PG thirteen so it's going to be more accessible to to you know families bring, bring bringing their kids yeah. and whatever and it just that just totally worked in the opposite of what of what yeah. they needed it to do yeah 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 I think that's funny too and uh, Zach Penn actually himself pointed out that it was ironic that they brought in Shane Black to rewrite the movie because like yeah. he because he's directly kind of spoofing. The kind of stuff that Shane Black was doing at that time, yeah, and uh, you know, I, I apparently you can find the full script that Zach Penn wrote originally. It's online. Uh, I didn't get a chance to read it, uh, but I asked one of my the, one of the people on G Rolls uh, who follow it mm-hmm. if they've ever checked it out, and they said they did read it. And they said it's very different. Um, it's you know you have to kind of use your imagination because you're reading something, but mm-hmm. um, a lot of the spoofing and stuff was there, but it felt at least reading it a little less whimsical and a little less childlike um, yeah. than, than what we got uh, with this. And, and by the way, I understand the reasoning on trying to position this for a young audience for children as well, because you know, it's the summer kids are out of school. They need movies too. Uh, kids certain age don't necessarily want to watch the animated movie of the moment. They want to watch something a little bit more fun <laughs> yeah. than that. Yeah. But like you said, this was PG 13, not too far, you know, off the ledge where they couldn't really go and see it because it's not rated R. So I I see the appeal and trying to get it to uh cater to them too. Uh, yeah. It just needed a little bit more focus, at least from a I, I wish I would have looked up the trailers and stuff for this before I started because I, I was trying to re- I didn't know how they promoted it <laughs> or how like what the what the uh <laughs> market what the marketing was like. But I'm assuming it that was also all over the place. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was <laughs> It was actually so all over the place. I mean, the trailers play like the big, it literally says something like the biggest action movie of 93 is here <laughs> this June, right? And whatever. But yeah. they actually partnered with NASA. This is a true fucking story. And you could look <laughs> it up on YouTube. They partnered with NASA to get the last action hero on a rocket. And then they also, Ooh. they tried to get, well, they they did get eventually, but they they. They put the name Schwar- you know, Schwarzenegger starring in or whatever. So Schwarzenegger yeah. is on the, the name Schwarzenegger is on the rocket, but it was so long that they couldn't fit it on the rocket. And so they were going to launch this rocket, but it it had so many problems with the with the getting the logo and the yeah, yeah. name on there that it didn't launch until three months after the movie had already bombed. And so so there was that. There was also a Burger King tie in. Um I'm not sure what exactly was done with that, but I think there's some some funny product placement in there. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, there were action figures. I mean, it, it was, they were so gearing it up. Over, it is all over the place. Yeah, it was gearing up to be, you know, the next T2, basically, right? But, oh, yeah. this time you can bring your your yeah, younger kids and grandma can come too and she'll love it. And so... It's a lot of that. This, rem- this reminds me, and not nearly as bad or egregious, but this reminds me of <laughs> the summer be- the summer before in 1992 when you got Batman Returns, and that was a uh, yeah, it's a superhero movie, it's a comic movie. We're gonna have yeah. all these like Happy Meal tie-ins and toys, yeah. and then when parents took their kids to see it, they're like, uh, there is a <laughs> lot of a lot of sexual innuendo. The penguin is really it gross. It's carrying my child. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So I, you know, so I love. I mean those stories are fun but like yeah marketing being like all over the place and not really knowing how to position a movie because Mm -hmm. uh you know the stories i heard about uh because warner brothers executives the the stipulation to get tim burton to do batman returns was tim burton was like i want full creative control because even though batman was successful um and he he made a lot of money and gave him a bigger boost as a filmmaker yeah he he said there was you know he didn't have as much control as he wanted. So like what he wanted for the sequel was total control. And this was a time when executives were so happy to have him that they were like, yeah. And they let him go unchecked until right. the movie was, until the movie was done. And so when they finally screened the movie, before, when they had to like set up how to market it, they were like, Oh, <laughs> this is not, how are we going to 
yeah. kids can't see this or how are we going to make this work? Or, and so I guess they just went with, all right, we're just going to throw it out there for children and just hope that their parents don't notice right. <laughs> that this is way more adult <laughs> than it should be. <clears throat> and you know, that and- certainly didn't wake up or work out for them. And like, I mean, I guess that'd be the same case with this. I just, sure. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. It'd be a hard, this would be a hard one to like, <clears throat> and especially with the Hollywood you know, <clears throat> satire spoof stuff also right. thrown in. Like you're asking an audience to understand like, the inner workings of the industry too a little right. bit yeah. <laughs> and that's a tough sell because like everyone doesn't understand <clears throat> all that stuff and like you know how that works and it won't be particularly funny to them if they don't yeah <laughs> get it. It, it, exactly and and you know you bring up a good point with batman returns i mean they i think even they you know even they didn't know where they were going i mean how is it that you know yeah. bruce wayne lives in a completely different mansion than he did in the first movie right and like this guy who's so one track you know uh fight crime very composed then he gets around michelle pfeiffer and he's like uh oh yeah. like all googly eyed and like whatever yeah. and, and i you know personally and like you know maybe people won't like like when i say this but i I, I dislike Batman Returns very, very much. I, I really, really do. I do not like it. I, I think that it's there's pieces of it that are really, really good. Um, Tim Burton I, movie first, Batman movie second. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah. And that control, I mean, we nobody likes when a studio comes in and tries to control, but like yeah. the control of the studio mixed with Tim Burton's wildness on the first one gave us one of the best Batman films of all time. And they just totally threw that out in the second one. I think, you know, again, I think Michelle Pfeiffer is is one of the best cat women ever. She's great right? in the movie, yeah. But I think Danny DeVito is probably the worst penguin that we've ever gotten. So and you know what's funny is that revisionist history, I mean, she'll always be considered the best cat woman. That, that hasn't sure. changed. Like, sure. I think that I think from 1992 to 2024, she is still considered like, even if you don't like that movie, the bright spot of that yeah. movie. Yeah. Now, what I feel like what revisionist history has done <laughs> is made Danny DeVito's Penguin like really good. Cause not, uh, he got nominated for a Razzie and, and back in <laughs> you know when when that movie came out. But now everyone looks at it in a totally different way, and it's also like it's interesting. It's the same thing with like this movie too. I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that revisionist history has changed Last Action Hero to be like, oh, it's like the greatest thing ever made. No, but I think what I think what re- revisionist history has done is allowed people to take a step back and look at it for what it was sure and and what it is without the pressure of it being a 1993 big summer movie uh that the studio really wanted it to be yeah i think with like with time away from a lot of these films you get to kind of like rethink what they what the intentions were and i think that is worked in this film's favor in particular you can still point out its flaws which i think we both acknowledge that there are flaws yeah, in, it's the, not a in the movie. movie. Yeah. But um, but I think what's great is the consideration that it gets for what it does right mm-hmm. and what people may not have gotten back in <clears throat> 1993, they you know certainly get now. And I think that is that's the positive side of revisionist history when it comes to movies. There are certain revisionist history things because of <laughs> film where I was like, I was like, we hated that 10 years ago and now we're all about it. Like, <laughs> uh, like yeah. whatever. Uh, yeah but yeah well, i mean i think with this movie we're just entering a phase of um you know fandom over analyzing everything and, and and we love to do that as movie fans i think that last action hero is it's not it's not a cult classic yet but i do believe after this next five to seven years of marvel doing the multiverse and like the deadpool stuff doing the meta stuff I think that it it will become because you can see on YouTube, there's very few like breakdowns or like uh, fan theory videos. Whereas you yeah. go to any other movie, there's tons, right? I think yeah. that this and the th- this movie in the next ten to fifteen years, because we we are in such a multiverse uh, sort of sort of meta commentary world right now. I think this will become. Uh, 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 you know the, the the midnight showing of of last action here actually- uh, your, you know your your local uh you know alamo draft house or like or whatever your your yeah. mom and mom pop movie theater i think it's on the i think that we're doing this episode early on last action hero to be honest because there's so many things 
even like the cameo stuff, like they were ahead of the 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 curve on that. Like when they're yeah, walking, you got, like, into little, the... you got little Richard, you got MC Hammer. Like that well, whole well, premiere of the movie is like yeah, littered with them. Yeah, <laughs> but even when they're walking into the police station, Sharon Stone is in the the famous white. Yeah. And she's like lighting a cigarette. The T one thousand Robert Patrick walks right by the kid, and the kid like looks over, like, "Are you seeing this kind of thing?" And yeah. then the other funny part is when they go into the real world, he takes him to a video store, like a blockbuster video or something. And every movie, like T two, uh, Predator, I think all the movies that Arnold Schwarzenegger stars in, in that reality. Sylvester yeah. Stallone is the one on the poster with the with the gun and in right. the, which is like that that is so like tongue in cheek kind of brilliant kind of funny um yeah. and 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 those little things you know I mean how do you have a conversation about Deadpool without little shit like that I mean to me no, it just yeah, it makes sense you know yeah I love I mean I'm some of the really good meta jokes uh, I mean to, I do want to ask you too uh, in addition to Arnold Schwarzenegger being a sport and making fun of himself. Yeah. Um, I think so many people have a different outlook on Arnold Schwarzenegger as an actor, performer, action star. Mm -hmm. um, I used to have debates with my friends whether or not he's good, a good actor, or <laughs> merely entertain, merely entertaining, right? Um, <clears throat> but I think that I think to be in on the joke, you have to be good on some level to really understand that you're yeah. the punchline. And <laughs> but I, I want to ask you, uh, in, in the case of this movie or in the case of, of across a few of his films, what do you think of him as a performer in these uh, in these particular movies? I mean, <clears throat> he, he's Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, I, the guy quite literally is larger than life. Um, if you I mean, Predator terminator terminator 2 you know commando um and then you go to like true lies like we mentioned earlier but yeah. also then you have like twins and kindergarten cop and you know, he did he he did all of these films and he's this this like again like this big figure in in pop culture and i think there's no agent that's going to tell you like, Hey, you need to be funny in this one. You know what I mean? Like that's him yeah. being like, guys, like, wouldn't it be funnier if I just played it straight in my, as myself and like, whatever. Da, da, da. And so I think you have to be good to do, to do something that just like totally lampoons your, your own, your own stuff that you just did that made your career. And like, yeah. I think, I think he's, he's, he's great in that aspect because what balls you have to have right to do t2 i mean you would think he would have followed that up with with some other i mean predator yeah, two or something he or like what he would have he would have tried to work with cameron faster yeah. or something again or like yeah, yeah anything and but no he took he took 15 million dollars to do this <laughs> <laughs> yeah he did last action hero a movie where he literally like gets into a fight with himself about how corny you know this, this stuff yeah. is and so yeah i, I think you have to be a pretty great performer and also, you know, pretty smart to, to be okay with you being the butt of the whole joke. Right. And I think yeah. that take, that takes a certain kind of person who knows their capabilities. And, and, and as he goes along in his career, he, he does get better as an actor. He does get funnier in some of these films, you know? Yeah. Um, do I see him winning an Oscar anytime soon? No. no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know? and it's funny because his it's funny because his biggest eighties competition was Sylvester Stallone, who uh has one under his belt with right. Rocky and right. you know, and even and then has an acting nomination because of uh you know going back to that franchise again mm -hmm. uh with Creed and all that. But I remember someone asking me, like, who do I prefer of the two of them? Um and I always I grew up both with both of their movies, but always had more fun with Arnold's movies. I never was a huge Rambo person, or I yeah. like some of the Rocky movies, so I've always been partial to Arnold Schwarzenegger. And you know, he doesn't, he, he I don't, he's only been to the Oscars. That's the thing, that's the closest thing he'll have to yeah, like yeah. getting get one. He, I don't even think they'll give Arnold an honor, an honor an Oscar. He's just invited to the party, and that's about it. That's all that's ever going to happen to Arnold Schwarzenegger in terms of acting awards. But yeah, yeah, he's also, sure. he's also funny, and yeah. I mean, he has a great sense of humor. Like, I love his comedy stuff, it's really good. Um, there's things that he does early in his career, like if, when you watch the Terminator, the first one. I mean, I know it's mostly just a physical walk around performance, <laughs> but he 
he is in the zone scary and yeah i mean he he is completely imposing and everyone can't do that no and i and i think it takes a level of talent to get that done and i it's interesting because someone like james cameron who is a pro- prolific director saw that in him too you yeah. know he you know he you know, turned like you know this guy who was like just known for fitness and working out and who could barely speak english at one point mm-hmm. and like turned him into you know i mean i know he had done conan and stuff of like that before that but you know it terminator made him a bona fide like action star yeah and and you know and then he carried that through the 80s and into the 90s uh his 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 output before becoming the governor of california um (laughs) it's been it's been interesting to revisit i revisit some of those movies uh in the last couple years like the sixth day and uh collateral damage and in the days yeah and and that is a rate yeah and that's like the lower end of his filmography but even rewatching them now i see little things in some of those movies that i didn't really pay attention to when i first saw them i was like oh that's sure. a throwaway Ar- arnold action movie and now i'm like oh yeah that's as bad as like because like I, I i rewatched in the days a year ago and mm-hmm. i know it's gonna sound like faint praise but like he's trying in that movie to like give a deeper <laughs> performance than just like you know a typical arm source day performance like this is someone who's down as like alcoholic like sure. he was trying and there was yeah. effort there but i think by that point because that's even after what batman and robin so there's a there's a i mean at that point his career was waning a bit he's an action star mm-hmm. who's getting older um you know and you know, this is that's something that happens a lot with women in the industry but even when your main uh genre that you work in is action and you're a man and you get older people start to take you less seriously in that role too so that was another weird thing to watch as you know we got into the 2000s with Arnold, like you know, this once mm-hmm. kind of prolific person of that genre was yeah. suddenly becoming was suddenly becoming old hat because maybe other new action stars were like moving in, and then also the action you know genre changed a lot uh, throughout the late nineties, early two thousands too. So we weren't getting a lot of stuff that Arnold was good at doing. Yeah, with. sure, and I also think you know we we joke about him not getting an Oscar, but I I do believe like there is a desire w- within him as an actor that you can clearly see even in this last action hero movie where he wants he's 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 challenging himself to do something different right like right. whether whether it's i mean fuck total recall man i mean yeah. that that's some of his best acting like acting yeah. acting like it's a guy who's woken up his whole life you, is a lie you right you feel his confusion genuine yeah, confusion as to exactly. what's happening around him so like yeah he so he sells and that very well that's what makes it work right and and in last yeah. action hero is is him trying to do something different and true lies even he's trying to do something different and so i think for arnold there is this desire to want to consistently do something to break out of just being an action star and then always yeah. go back to it when it's fun always go back to it when it feels good right but then go do something else and you know, somebody could do a documentary that's similar to the one they did with Val Kilmer that I'm sure would pull on all of our heartstrings about Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know? And I also yeah. think we're, you know, in, in another 10 years, we'll be in biopic territory with, with, with him or, or whatever. And so, the, you know, the possibilities there, I think, are, are endless if, if done right. And I, and I think his story is is valid. And, and you know him and stallone <clears throat> they both saw the value in doing something yeah they're always going to come home to their expendables kind of like blow shit up but they're yeah. sm- they're smart enough to desire to have that desire to be funny to have that desire to 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 act in a way that's not just this big tough guy right and so yeah. i think that he deserves a lot of credit for for giving it a shot and sometimes it works i mean Dude, kindergarten cop is fucking hilarious. True, true that lies. Works. Yeah, yeah. Man. True lies is like funny yet whatever. And like the thing between him and his wife, that is a story of of a marriage that's on the rocks, really at its core. And it takes yeah. somebody smart to be able to to be able to act in that. And what's funny about True Lies is it was the follow up to Last Action Hero, but pieces of True Lies feel like kind of corny ish. Like uh, yeah. the, the action it's, scenes. it's kind of a play on like 
it feels like in a way, and I know like it's not intentionally, sure. or maybe they did it a little bit, but it feels like almost a spoof satire of like a James Bond movie. Like it would be like if you gave oh. Arnold his own James Bond movie. So it is a lot of silliness into it in it, but I think someone like James Cameron made that work a bit yeah. more than like, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, he was that, that, that came he together well. Yeah, he wasn't gonna let a bunch of script doctors fuck that one. Yeah, but yeah, like, fuck that up. Yeah. Shout out to Tom Arnold and True Lies, the unsung hero of that movie. That dude fucking kills in that movie. Yeah, he has some funny stuff in that movie too. Oh, yeah. Um and I kind of wonder, and uh, and this is like going back to Arnold, like what you what you're thinking about after Terminator 2, like what do I pick? And mm-hmm. then what do you think about after Last Action Hero? What do I do? Right. And I think it's I mean, I think it's interesting that you know the first movie he did after Last Action Hero was True Lies, and he went back and worked with James Cameron. Yeah. So, so someone who he had had guaranteed hits with at that yeah. point. Mm-hmm. And a very smart strategic thing to do. And I wonder if there was pressure after Terminator 2 as to what he would choose to do next. Like what would be the next action movie that he would jump into? Because there was no I, I I know there were murmurs about Terminator 3 back then a little bit, but they yeah. weren't loud enough. They weren't loud enough to be like, oh, this is this is gonna happen within a couple of years, that kind of thing. So it was yeah. like, what does he what does he do next? And I, I would be interested to know like what he was offered during that time, like that period between yeah that would be really cool to know that yeah and i think yeah. what's crazy is i think i think he probably would have went right into true lies with and what a, what an amazing success story that would have been yeah um but you know we all know that james cameron notoriously works slow because he loves his quality and no one's gonna mess with that i mean look at the avatar yeah. films whatever yeah. i mean even the break between terminator one terminator two yeah he did some other things but you know i think True Lies probably wasn't ready, and and I think he saw Last Action Hero as this because I know the original script for Last Last Action Hero was called Extremely Violent. That was the working title <laughs> of, of the film, oh which I think is great. I mean, again, it's like Scream before Scream, um, yeah. and 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 there are there's some capacity. I mean, you know, again, his, his son is like thrown off a rooftop in, in the opening <laughs> opening <laughs> scene. Uh, so they retain some of that. And there's a lot of like premature ejaculation jokes. So the movie does have that yeah. e- that edge. Right. But, <clears throat> you know, he's shooting people and stuff. There's a lot of explosions in this, too. But I think that yeah. attra- attracted to him. And then once he got on set, it was kind of like a Bill Murray Ghostbusters 2 kind of thing where it's like, wait a minute. This isn't what we talked about. This so what we signed up for. Yeah. yeah. So he was. Yeah kind of questioning are we going too far like you know or whatever and so i think then let's call shane back in and whatever and so i think that's the the movie's kind of a victim of trying to make everybody happy and i think you know that's what how you get a cult classic or a a soon to be cult classic right before you get a blockbuster because this thing tanked this thing tanked really bad yeah it did um (laughs) Actually, yeah, eighty-five million dollar budget. It made one hundred and thirty-seven point three million dollars worldwide. But at the time, they said they reportedly probably lost twenty-six million dollars on the movie um, by the end of its run. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, it was a it was a big case of the blame game. A lot of people were like shifting. Like, uh, what are some of the funnier uh, responses to it not doing well? Uh, Schwarzenegger blamed the film's poor performance on bad press and the election of Democratic President Bill Clinton, which he said influenced audiences to see 1980s action film stars as lowbrow. So he was <laughs> saying that, like, so that was one of his reasons. Yeah. Uh, Shane Black also was just critical of the movie. Uh, the most of it is the release date, which, um, Arm Schwarzenegger, I guess, tried to get them to move that release date a lot, uh, at least two or three weeks away from Jurassic Park. And mm-hmm. Sony Pictures was like, it costs money to do that and it does but i think the money they lost <laughs> uh in retrospect i yeah. wonder that's probably it probably would have been less that's just shifted and who knows i don't know if it even would have worked if they if like but it it probably would have had a bigger opening weekend and it probably wouldn't have been in the wake of i mean jurassic park was a really big movie that summer it i think it dominated most of that summer yeah so I hung around maybe, too. yeah i maybe it would have been like <clears throat> a lose like trying to get it away from jurassic park would have been extremely hard but within yeah. the, but, but within his second weekend scenes uh, that was just silly <laughs> yeah it was really and dumb. like yeah. i mean they were i feel like they were really banking <clears throat> on schwarzenegger to be able to stand up against spielberg and the return of dinosaurs <laughs> yeah but if they would have just moved, moved it a month to the end of july 
I mean, I'm a six weeks yeah. away from Jurassic Park. I think that you have a barely successful movie, but successful. I think that it, yeah. you know, the marketing would have had more time and, you know, uh, maybe you lean into, okay, well, this was, this was, this is fun. This is good. Right. And, um, I don't, I don't, I don't think we ever would, would have gotten a sequel out of it. Although I'm fascinated as to what that would have been. Um, yeah. but I do think that, you know, releasing it within and they, and, and the thing is, is th I mean, again, Steven fucking Spielberg is coming with a movie about fucking dinosaurs that, that are going to, they're going to eat everybody. I mean, why yeah. in the world would you just not hit the panic button and move the thing six weeks yep. to, to the end, to the end of July? Because end of July, I mean, that's, that's, you know, and this is pre Nolan obviously, but that's right in the sweet spot where Nolan drops all his movies. And yep, that's when people are like, fuck August is coming. I don't really like August. Cause then September comes. I want to get out of here and watch movies back then in 93. Right. It's like cash cow, you know, and it's especially yeah. Schwarzenegger in this big premiere and it's the only action movie around for, for that. But I think Jurassic park, you know, quite literally ate a lot of their profits. And I think they said that the screenings, were <laughs> the, really the pre bad. were really bad <laughs> and so that and that, that's, that got leaked yeah yeah that, that yeah was bad. yeah some it's hard to kill that <clears throat> even yeah. in 1993 that that uh it's hard to i mean it's even it's it's virtually impossible in 2024 to kill negative press like sure. that yeah I'm, I'm sure even then that was hard to once that got out that like oh those screenings weren't good and that information got out there it kind of put a nail in the movie's cover and i think for sure yeah no it did. early and they and they also said on cisco and ebert that i think it was cisco said the movie was 10 minutes too long before the movie came out so that was also <laughs> put out into the ether uh you know ahead of time um right. it's so funny because i've cut recovery so many movies on anniversaries and then on the deep dive and cisco and ebert get brought up a lot on the show it's just some movies that they either really love and there's some movies i'm surprised they just did not like like we just did we just covered dead poet society and i didn't know roger ebert did not like that movie and wow. I like to play it gave me like two stars out of four and didn't think Robin Williams should have been nominated for an Oscar for it. And Holy like that threw, threw me. Uh, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, they, they get brought up a lot when we cover movies. It's like, I mean, they had pretty strong opinions uh, during that time. Yeah. So, and they would, yeah, I guess they would always sense. like, yeah, they would fight with each other. And if one guy yeah. thought whatever, and uh, you know, I, I mean, I I've seen, uh, it, it's fascinating. And those guys were here in Chicago doing that yeah. and, and they were like big time celebrities and, you know, just from, from covering movies. And you know, the funny part about them is they didn't even like each other in the beginning. I think they became nope. friends, but you know, yeah. they respect each other after they maintain yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and they're still heroes here. The there's the one of them has an actual theater named after him here in Chicago. So, um, you know, and and that's the thing is you go back and look at who is reviewing these things, and just as although I think Rotten Tomatoes is is losing a bit of its credibility here and there, uh, it's still sort of like when you see that it's a fucking splat, it's like uh, I don't know if I'm gonna like this, and we all wait anticipate. You know, we're anticipating the the score for for some of our 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 favorite movies and whatever and that can affect it but back in the day dude if 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 Cisco and Ebert gave it a double thumbs down i mean your your movie's toast yeah for the most part um, i pulled up um the domestic boss office for the summer 93 and <laughs> had had they moved last action hero to the end of july its competition would have been Rising Sun. I think that's a movie with uh, I want to say we was it nice with Sean Connery. Oh yeah, uh, so that would have been its competition. Uh, that last weekend, uh, Robin Hood Men in Tights would have also been its competition. It outgrossed those uh, two movies. Uh, <laughs> and another one, so I Married an Axe Murder would have been its competition as well. Um, at the end of July, so I agree with you. That probably would have been a better yeah. spot yeah. for it. Yeah. Um uh movies uh, it, so it, it was number 11 for domestic box office. Uh it made 50 million dollars in the states. Um Jesus. the movies that the movies that made more money than it were Dennis the Menace, Dave, <laughs> this is just in the summer. Uh Dave uh Free Willy. Uh Cliffhanger, that's interesting, dude. That's a fun competition between him and Sylvester Stallone. I love Cliffhanger. Uh, uh In the Line of Fire, mm. uh Sleep Sleepless in Seattle. 
uh, The Fugitive, The Firm, and then, of course, Jurassic Park was the biggest movie of the summer of 1993. Wow. So, yeah, I, I think, I think, uh, and by the way, the gap between <laughs> Jurassic Park made $316 million uh, during its initial run. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then <laughs> after that, The Firm is in second with $149.2 million. So the gap between the biggest movie of the summer and the second biggest movie of the summer is huge. Yeah. And I think actually moving Last Action Hero around during that summer probably would have benefited it in a significant way. Yeah, I mean, even if you can't, I mean, move it as far away from the dinosaurs as possible. It's possible, oh, yeah. Yeah, you have to. I mean, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but we still see these moves emulated today in Hollywood where they don't, it's like, you know, even if they know they have something or if they, if they, it, they just they just do these stupid things anyway where the execs are like no 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 we're dropping it now yeah. because tax this and da, 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 da. it's like it, that ruins a film's chances and you know eventually they find life you know on on you know well now streaming or, or streaming, home video yeah. or, or whatever it is but you know, when you crush something like that, I mean, just to not, just to know that Spielberg is coming with, again with dinosaurs, <laughs> what, get the fuck out of the way, bro. Like, don't, yeah. what, are you, what are you doing? Take your action movie and run like hell. And even, it was, dude, it was you number one for three weeks. I mean, like, by the time, yeah, end of July, by the time of the end of July, it, it was ranking number five, which is like, it would have been fine to release last action hero at the end of July. Yeah. That would have been enough time away from, you know, dinosaurs being number one for three weeks and then dropping number two. For another three weeks, and then they kind of subsequently fell down to five. So, and, and the thing is, is there's a marketing campaign in that, right? Like you have all this yeah. build, build up, and it's like, you, you know, picture the '90s voiceover guy. Like, even the last action hero isn't messing with dinosaurs. We'll see you at the end yeah. of July, you know, or whatever. And then, like, like right. have shooting get set stuff or whatever. And then, right. yep. and, and then it becomes this thing, like, oh my god, they moved, and it become you get an extra press cycle out of it because you're not. You know, you're respecting the, this how big of a beast, you know, Jurassic Park is, yeah. is, is about to become because that that thing just ran forever. That was another, you know, it was uh, in theaters a while. Oh god! And then it was in dollar theaters for like a year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at it. it played all the way through the end of the year. Holy in, shit! In, in, into Martin Luther King weekend of wow next, of night. Yeah. Oh my that god! That is ridiculous. Ridiculous! <laughs> oh my is, like, god! I mean, movies don't do that anymore. It's rare no. for movies to stay in theaters that long. Yeah, they're at, they're at home by the time you feel like they're third weekend in theaters. You can watch it at home. Yeah, <laughs> uh, seriously. Yeah, and which is, I mean, it's cool, but it's also a bummer because I, I love yeah. when movies play for. I mean, a couple times, like I just went to see um the new Bad Boys, and it was just the the just the third week, and I had trouble. I, I mean. I'm, l- I'm lucky I live in Chicago. Literally, I could throw something right now and it would hit an, a- an Alamo draft house, which is I'm very oh, lucky. Lucky, dude. yeah. <laughs> oh, dude. I'm still- no, I can't I can hit I can hit an AMC, which is not as cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, but the thing is, is you know, it, it's like in the third week, I would, you know, our 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 selection of showtimes for bad boys was quite limited. And the thing about it is, is that was a that bad boys was a hit. So it's like, man. Yeah. If you want to see a movie, it's not a hit. Good luck, because because yeah, um, that opening weekend and nothing. <laughs> it's like if it's a bad opening weekend, then dude, it's like, you're done. Uh, it's out of yeah, there. Yeah, and you might as well just wait for it to come home. And I hate that because, again, you know, obviously, I don't have to stress this here on on this fucking show, but like we're purists, right? We love the theater experience, and yeah, and so it's just better in the theater. The sound, yeah. the peep, the popcorn smell, the fucking just the idea that you have to buy tickets and go. And so yeah. I think I think that's awesome. And and Alamo Draft House actually does uh maybe they'll sponsor the show, but but because I've said it so um, many times. Maybe. But they're doing the summer of the nineties right now where like they're showing nineties movies like oh, that's I, perfect. Batman, fucking Terminator, everything. Like so, you know, um if you can catch one of those in the theater, it's still it's still a fucking fun ride. That's awesome. Know? Yeah, hell yeah. Um, we we spent uh, some time talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger, but I guess we'd be remiss not to mention his young co-star. I know we talked about him a little bit, mm-hmm. but yeah, what do we, what did you think of Austin O'Brien? I mean, I, I know we called him precocious <laughs> earlier in the episode. Um, 
I will say he does capture the kind of childlike, you know, whimsy. Of, yeah. Uh, of being in that position and you feel his excitement. Yeah. I can see some viewers being like now being like Ugh, a little bit. This like, kid's annoying. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, but what I will say, I think works uh, even, even in a script that probably went through, uh, like we said, so many hands mm -hmm. is you do feel the, bond and connection between the two of them like he clearly wants a a father figure and mm -hmm. this guy represents that to him and you kind of see x later kind of realizing how important that role is to yeah this kid as well um you know and an even better movie that i think that really shit would have like shined a little bit brighter but i do think you see uh it a bit and i think that is one of the things that also works is that they do form this kind of cool and fun bond and alliance with each other um yeah. and they actually have pretty good like you know it was like kind of like father-son chemistry a bit or a, yeah a little bit the two of them. yeah so yeah. yeah i think that works but like what did you think of him over overall so i like him I, I think i think that he is our vehicle into the the not only this film as a whole but uh into the film within the film right and we get to live this adventure um through him and and he does a really good job uh, of that right um yeah. i think that that he was brought into this and paired with schwarzenegger because they saw how well arnold did with edward furlong and t2 so they wanted That's another an, good yeah. yeah they wanted another pairing like that but this was like you know again more for families um and it's it's interesting because arnold's the jack slater character loses a son in the in the first act and then this kid doesn't have a father and so i think there was probably more there that they didn't go into because of god knows what reason right yeah. um it's important to mention that the guy that killed jack slater's son does return and at the at the end the rooftop ripper comes back there's a big battle and all that um and i think you know the kid is good at sort of setting how dangerous what is happening really is because he's he's seen the film right he knows how jack slater one two and three end right. jack slater four he's he can tell him like okay remember when you did this and da, da, da. so he has all these this knowledge of what's whatever and so right. i i like him i like him i like him i think he was a good pick to do this i think um he was really good at showing how terrible his real life was compared to how happy he was in the movie theater yeah. And that scene where like the dynamite comes rolling out of the screen, he's like, he immediately dumps a popcorn bucket on it to put it out. Yeah. You know, he's smart. So I, I like him. I like him as a character. I like him as an actor. Yeah. And he has, he also has like the whole wide eyed thing. And it's yeah. going on. Like he, he, you can tell how, how excited he is. And, yeah. Uh, so yeah. when I said precocious earlier, it wasn't an insult, <laughs> but it, it, uh, yeah, it, he, he's perfectly fine. He's got a lot of energy. And he matches Arnold Schwarzenegger's uh, humor well, and they work well together. In it. Yeah, um, yeah. There's a good. I also want to give a shout out. Give a shout out to Tom Noonan. Not so much for this one, I guess. I mean, he's he's a rooftop ripper in this movie. But I didn't mm. recognize when I saw his face. I was like, oh, that's Kane from Robocop too. I totally. He uh, <laughs> is the main is a is a main villain in that. And there's not there's a lot of like fucked up, messed up things in Robocop two that make it not as good as the original. And there's some things in that sequel that make it a uh, in parts kind of a little bit at least on par with the original and yeah his performance as kane is one of them he is a he's fucking scary yeah he, he's fucking <laughs> evil evil, yeah. evil 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 uh and i i think for a long time as a kid i was just convinced that that wasn't acting that was just who that guy was uh there was yeah. something very smarmy about him <laughs> in that movie. yeah he has a quiet <laughs> he, he, he's the master of a quiet evil in robocop 2 and in, in robocop 2 when you know they're hanging out with this little kid remember the fucking the little yeah there's so the much of it that doesn't make sense yeah. it just like curses a lot and like he's he's a part of this whole little like drug syndicate yeah <laughs> but that scene that scene where they 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 have the cop on the like uh he's like tied to the um the gurney right yeah and and kane makes the the whomever like cut into the cops like chest or whatever yeah and the, and the little kid goes to look away and he grabs his head and he makes him watch <laughs> yeah that's fucked up oh, man yeah, that's yeah, see yeah. yeah that scene with the cops screaming like that is absolutely yeah. insane dude yeah absolutely insane he's a great like, bad guy 
I'm not saying he's like better than Clarence Barter. That's a that's a different type of evil. No. But I'm just I'm, yeah. I'm just saying that like while uh, Kurtwood Smith was like very like in your face, I'm evil. Uh, K was very slow and yeah. silent and methodical. Yeah. And sadistic. Well, and, and, and Clarence, <laughs> I think Clarence Boddicker is a, a way better name than Kane. Kane sounds Kane, too, yeah. too on the nose. And you know what's scary about, uh, you know, it's, I love this about, about Kurtwood Smith playing Clarence Boddicker <laughs> is the, the fucking chewing gum, man. People, yeah, the, yeah. the fucking chew, he's going through the worst things that could possibly ever happen. He's just chopping on this gum. I think he takes yeah. it out and puts it out on someone's name played at one point in the Yo, movie. Fun <laughs> fact about the lady that plays the girl uh that he does that to. That was uh I think they're still married, but they were married at the time. Uh that's his wife. Wow. And so so like <laughs> that was uh that's what made that scene kind of funny that he was being so like smarmy to her. Yeah. And uh yeah so I thought that was kind of cool. And what a shame um, we're not gonna get a proper Robocop um you know Robocop returns man I I would kill for one of those. That that's a, a movie uh, franchise I never quite got the chance to really be. I no. actually like RoboCop too. It's I do too. Diff- it's different, for yeah. sure, and it and it doesn't have the same like emotional depth as like Rob- no. RoboCop. Su- RoboCop surprisingly does have a lot of emotional depth to it. It's really it, well done. Yeah, I feel like RoboCop two is again. It plays almost like well, this movie did, where it's like almost feels like it's spoofing and almost like it's a satire of like, yeah, it what, goes what, back and of, forth of, of yeah. what came before it. That movie feels like it's totally all over the place too, mm-hmm. but definitely not for kids, even though there's a child there. That's a part of this. <laughs> game, that, that's a part of this. It's, game so, weird. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird. Especially when the kid dies. It's just, yeah, weird. It's I know just it's, a, it's a, it's a plot point that makes no sense to me. Even as yeah. an adult, I was like, why did they do this? <laughs> Unless they were just trying to show the effect of, of, of violence on kids <laughs> and that they could, this is what, could happen but it's yeah. a very extreme example yeah uh, I, I know we got a we got a robocop uh video game recently that i haven't played it yet but i would love to take some time to do that that actually has um peter weller's voice and you can move around oh, in, nice. in that world of the late 80s dystopian detroit i grew up like 40 minutes from detroit so i was always a big robocop robocop yeah. fan yeah yeah it always great stuff too yeah, there's also the cute cold i don't know if you saw the documentary the robocop one they did it's very extensive documentary about the making of the first movie. And, no. And it was cool to actually see uh, Peter Weller talk because he doesn't really talk a lot about Robocop, at least in recent years, but he did for this documentary that these people put together. They got everyone they could that is basically, you know, still alive that yeah. worked on that movie from cast crew. Is it new? Writer. Yeah, it came out last year, I believe. Do you know what it's called? Um, I'll say, I think it's called uh, RoboDoc. Like, I'm trying to play on the whole like RoboCop documentary. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Uh, I'll send you a link for it though. It was, it was, it's really, really good. It's oh, a little long, fucking... but, uh, but oh, it's man. like it, it's yeah. fully extensive, and they are doing one for RoboCop too. So I'm actually oh, excited. Oh shit! Okay. I'm actually always excited for like the documentaries about the yeah. sequels because like you know sometimes a sequel doesn't get as much love, right? The RoboCop two doesn't really get as yeah. much love, e- even though uh. <laughs> You know, Shout Factory made a cool collector's edition that just came out that uh, for 4K. That's so like some of those sequels do get a little bit of love later. Yeah, but I yeah. but I'm always curious as to how those were made because you know you always hear about how like the really great original film was made, but not the follow up. Yeah, I, I, I don't need a documentary about RoboCop three, but RoboCop two I will I will take. And yeah, I love RoboCop and, two or or the remake. I don't need I don't need one on that either, but. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, uh, it really good stuff. I'll send it over to you. Um, yeah, no, for sure. And there, there is one other bad guy in Last Action Hero, and he's played by the guy who I can't think of the actor. Fuck, uh, he played Tyrion Lannister in um, in Game of Thrones. He has like oh, one, yeah. like one yeah, eyeball. And, uh, <laughs> Charles uh, Walter Charles Dance. Uh, yeah, he is a, he's very. All his movies and TV shows are very British. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, he plays an excellent <laughs> bad guy in this one, but he could have yeah. he, he could have been given. I feel like maybe a lot of his scenes were cut out of Last Action Hero, but yeah, he, he's got this goofy thing with an eyeball, like he's missing an eye, <laughs> so he's putting in these different eyeballs, and one of, one of them's a bomb, and like I don't know, there's a smiley face eyeball, but he's a really good shot. He's a one eye guy with a re- he's a really good uh, handgun. He's really accurate, so yeah, we got to uh, mention him. Made his feature film debut in the James Bond film For Your Eyes Only in 1981. And you've probably seen him in Michael Collins, Gosford Park. It's all the British stuff. The Imitation yeah. Game, uh, Mank and the Kingsman. 
Uh, he was also in Alien 3, uh, oh, wow. Last Action, Last Action Hero, as we just pointed out, Godzilla, King of the Monsters. Uh, and then, like you said, he was on Game of Thrones for a few years as well. Mm-hmm. And he was, and then for all you people that like very highbrow British TV, he was on The Crown for a year. For, oh, wow. <laughs> from 2019. From 2019 oh, to wow. 2020. Yeah. 77, 77 years old and still getting after it, acting. So good for him. Yeah. Yeah, he kills it. He, I, everything he, I've seen him and he's been good. He's, he, he, I've never seen him play a good guy, but that's fine. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Um. So in 2019, as we wrap things up, Arnold Schwarzenegger said that he would be interested in doing a legacy sequel to this movie. Would you want to see a legacy sequel to Alex Shash and Hero? And what do you think it would be? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Please. Can we get like a uh, a petition for this? Because <laughs> even if it's fan funded, crowd funded, yes, I would absolutely fucking love to see a legacy sequel to this. And I think this one takes on just how meta and multiverse everything has gotten, and they take yeah. they take credit for it in a meta way. Like they're only making a sequel to prove how much that they are responsible for the multi multiverse of Marvel and DC and the meta stuff with, with everything, with any character who talks to the talks to the fucking camera. I mean, they should, they should definitely do it. There's so much to mine. I, I, you know, um, bring back him and the, and the 43 year old kid at this point. Right. And, and then, and then have them hop through different films and they can comment on, you know how how action movies just aren't what they used to be and, and like he goes to kill somebody so like, you can't do that anymore you can't do that's not that's not politically correct like like that that could be a really great sequel yeah for sure yeah and i know this would be a cheesy way to include him but just in case austin o'brien is interested in returning to acting the only way i could see you would include him because he's 43 now is if maybe <laughs> he has a son if maybe he has a son and maybe his son is like going you know has the same kind of like imagination as he does when it comes to yeah movies because yeah. i mean i would want to try to include austin o'brien if possible but i think that'd be the only way to do it because we can't have 43 year old austin o'brien still thinking that uh movies are <laughs> something you can like escape into like that in a real <laughs> yeah yeah well maybe they get trapped in one you know like, the, yeah, he's like i don't want to do this again this is you know or whatever right i think there's so many different things there's so much more material now and i think trying to it would be fun to see them do it and try to be extremely violent and sexist. Yeah. And then they're like, like, Oh, you can't say you can't be sexist like that. Like you, you can't make jokes yeah. about women like that anymore. Like whatever. Like I think that's how that's, that's the entryway into it. And then you could also have them. Um, Cause there's a fucking Hamlet scene in, the, in this, <laughs> in, in, the, in this, in the, in this movie. But I think yeah. that you, you could, you could totally lampoon all the Marvel multiverse stuff. You could have a character that's, that pops up. That's like Dr. Strange. Or it's like, you know, <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Weirdo or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so much you could do. No, there are a lot of possibilities, I think mm-hmm. for it to work. Yeah. And, you know, and like a lot of these people just talk about it more. You might will it into existence. I know this is a different scenario because Freaky Friday was financially successful, but Jamie Lee Curtis willed that sequel into existence. Oh, they yeah. just started. They just started filming on Monday. And before the writer's strike, I I think a little bit before she won her Oscar for everything everywhere all at once. And mm-hmm. I think it helped when she won her Oscar to push this ahead a little bit. Oh, hell yeah. But she was like trying to, you know, let's get the band back together. Let's do Freaky Friday 2. I've talked to Lindsay Lohan. She wants to do it. And, you know, Lindsay Lohan has, you know, she's put her life back together in a really significant way, right? She's married, has a kid. Uh, she has a pretty big Netflix deal. I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily love the rom-com she's making for them, but sure. she's making she's making money with them. So, like, Jamie Lee Curtis kept willing that. And then finally, it was like, we got a writer. We got a director. And now, yeah. Lindsay and her are coming back. And now they got the whole cast from Freaky Friday coming back for this sequel. So sometimes you can just will things into existence by just talking about it over, yeah. and over and over again. And you know, I'm not saying that Last Action Hero two it may go to theaters. It could probably it probably would go to streaming. I don't know, but I think that um, I would. I mean, I what I do agree with your point that I feel like it's a few more years before it becomes like a bigger cult hit. Mm-hmm. Um, but our source here has like a lot of years. He's older, so we need sure. it sooner than that. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we need it sooner than that. So I don't know. I I would like to see it. I think that I think there are some good ideas that there, especially with the way the industry works now and how many of these movies have tackled 
the whole multiverse stuff before or now more lately. And I, I agree that there's a lot more stuff to play with and it could, it could be a fun sequel. I would, I would like to see it. Yeah. I mean, even the title last action hero, right? So maybe the sequel deals with what happens in the movie universe when an action hero is done. Where do they go? Yeah. Is there some retirement home that they go to? And what is the mission that a 43 year old, you know, uh, kid, what is his name? Austin, uh, Austin, Austin oh, O'Brien. Dan- that's the actor's name. Yeah. And Danny, or I guess yeah. would be the actor. So, yeah. so then he has to go into the movie again. Yeah. And then, and then pull so and so out of whatever, you know, retirement for action heroes there are. And they go on some journey to, you know, reclaim the glory that should have been theirs for the first movie. That's my pitch for the. Oh, there the, you go. You know, like that. Like we need to prove to these people that it was us that did this first. Like, why? Why do we need to prove anything? Because, and like what, you know, he's trying to convince him to come out of retirement. And like, <laughs> what does it look like? And think of, when you go up into the mountains or whatever retreat where all the action heroes go, you could have some of Sol- Stallone's characters there. You could have some of uh, Tom Cruise's characters. I mean, every, you know, everybody who's ever been in an Expendables movie, they're retired or whatever, right? Dolph Lundgren's, yeah. are, what, I mean, you, you could really have some fun with that. And the cameos could just be nuts. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think if, if Deadpool, I, I mean, and obviously it's, I keep going back to this, but you know, it, it's it's in that same vein, and I and I think this next Deadpool movie is just going to shatter all sorts of records. Yeah, and it's they're going to be, be huge. super meta about stuff, and I love that they're doing that, and I love that you know Ryan Reynolds fought for this to be to be R, and you know he he fought right. for Deadpool to like happen, and it goes to show that you know sometimes you know sometimes studios are really really wrong, right? Leak yeah. test footage leads to whatever, so maybe the studios really got it wrong on, on, on the timing on of last action hero. And, and it deserves, yeah. Put the fucking thing on. You're telling me Netflix won't give 80 million for that. Let's go. And he's already working with Netflix as a show. Arnold Schwarzenegger does. So the, the connection's already there. Yeah. Make, make it happen. Yeah. yeah let's fucking Arnold, go. Ar- 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 Arnold talk about it some more and will it to existence. Like your buddy, Jamie Lee Curtis did for freaky Friday. For real. Yeah. Make that, yeah. <laughs> make that happen. Totally. Um, all right. All right, we're at the point of the show where we have to give the movie a score, like uh, like we've done before. You can do, you can do a uh, grade. Uh, you can do like letterbox score of like you know out of five stars, whatever. Um, what uh, score do you get? Uh, this has been harder for me to do lately for certain movies because it's like, yeah, am, am, like am I scoring it as a film or like based on like entertainment value? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh okay so i oh fuck um i'm gonna give this three and a half stars and 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 that it's purely because it is so much fun to watch um and it it, it is it, it's ahead of its time um and this show that we are doing you know just to stay in the meta zone here we're ahead of, of of our time by doing this episode so i'm yep. going to give it you know three three and a half stars so everybody watching this in the future in five or ten years <laughs> you know and last action heroes become this like cult classic right you, know, like you, you said know, it here yeah i gave it three and a half stars right. but but you know it's again it's not going to win any oscars it's no terminator too but it's it's a hell of a ride and you can point out the cameos you can point out all the things that they did 25 years before Marvel did. I mean, it's all there. Yep. Um, I'm going to go a little, I'm going to give it three. It's a little lower, but <laughs> okay. I still, I still found it enjoyable and it was entertaining. I think it has like a lot of grand ideas. Some of them work and some of them don't. Yeah. But, I mean, but then reading about what the movie's production was like that, that had a lot to do with, you know, mm-hmm. just a lot of cooks, a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Yeah. And that, happens, that happens on certain movies. But I was thoroughly entertained, and I do agree that it's ahead of its time in a lot of ways. And it probably it deserved a lot better when it came out, um, yeah. and it got. Um, Sony Pictures probably should have nurtured this one a bit more, and they probably would have had a little bit more success from it. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but I I enjoyed it, and I hadn't watched it in a really long time. And like I said, my last you know watch of it, I was kind of like eh, toss it aside. <laughs> but with this one, I was. I looked at all these things that are like, wow, you are seeing a lot of this stuff in the industry today on how these mm-hmm. certain action movies are done. And then the whole angle of like, like you said, the multiverse and all that is prevalent in so many of the movies that are popular today, especially the Marvel DC stuff. So mm-hmm. yeah, 
ahead of his time, really good. Uh, I agree that Arnold Schwarzenegger, like for underrated movies in his uh, filmography, it's it's up there. Totally. And and I'm, and I'm actually glad that you know it is getting it has more eyes on it now than it. Yeah, it deserves it. And, and, yeah, I think it does. So this was a solid, solid, another solid pick from you. Um, Thank you. Thank I'm you. Sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure there will be more solid picks from you in the near fu- in the near future. Uh, and I'm looking really looking forward to it. Like we said at the beginning of the episode, Dustin will be on much more often, at least twice a month. Yeah. Uh, w- with some fun picks. And hopefully we talked ourselves out of a corner uh, with Last uh, Action Hero. Yeah. I think we I think we did though. No, I we de- we I definitely did. we wiggled out of the out of the chairs <laughs> that were strapped to yeah. a ticking bomb and got the fuck yeah. out of. Yeah, we totally did. I mean, if you if anybody listening watching this doesn't want to go watch it, then then re-listen to this until you do. So, so yeah. <laughs> I think I think we made a case not only for the fact that it was a great uh film for its time, but that, you know, due to you know, some ego and, and some, some marketing misfires, right. Um, that it could yeah. have been an even better, uh, hit in the theaters and that it's definitely, it's definitely at the very absolute least worth the rewatch and at the absolute most it's worth a sequel. So I yep. think we definitely talked ourselves out of a corner. I think we did. And yeah. that's going to be the fun thing about whatever movie you pick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they're constantly talking to yourself about the quarters. Uh, yeah, it's good. Because they're always yeah. all different, and that's what makes it fun too, as well. That these yeah. are all and like very different movies. Pointing things out, I think that maybe some people go, "Oh my god, I thought that too." But most people are like, "I never thought that." I wonder if that is a thing. I mean, that's going to be something fun. I think that I want to bring to these episodes is like, you never know what's coming next, and one day we will do Vanilla Sky, and it'll be a really long yes. episode. Maybe <laughs> yeah. a, maybe a two parter. Who knows? Might, right? ha- might have to because there's a yeah. lot to unpack there. I need to get yeah. that on 4K. Uh, I have it on Blu-ray, but there is a 4K edition of Bill Sky that I probably need to get before we talk about it. But yes, we yeah. will eventually. We kind of talked about Bill Sky on your first episode, so eventually yeah, it'll players. happen. But I think it'll have to be when you guys least expect that. I just can't just throw it out there. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah for sure. Just throw some curveballs your way. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, you'll be hearing more Dustin. We also have other guests lined up to be on the deep dives as well with some interesting picks. I just got a few from a few people now we have that want to get on the schedule we have some for idiocracy tombstone the crow mm. and team america so all very very different uh, very solid different movies. solid picks solid picks yeah. uh that are going to be scheduled out over the next uh few months so we're very excited about that and like the main show you can find uh back to the box represents deep dives on spotify on Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, but you should probably get the playlist studio app because they are a podcast network and they do a lot of the heavy levy lifting and all that pesky editing that I don't have time for or Jackson has time for. <laughs> um, uh, and they're great. So if you want to download that app, uh, you can get it from the iOS store or the Google Play store. As always, Dustin, it's been a pleasure. Good yeah. conversation as yeah. always. Pleasure Looking forward mine. to having a lot more. And I'm glad I can say that we will be doing this a lot more. Uh, and a lot sooner because before when you would sign off like yeah we should do this again sometime <laughs> <laughs> and now uh and now that has like you know a more finite uh sure time yeah. stamp on it so looking forward to it and yeah so until next time guys thank you for listening thank you again dustin and uh, of course. we'll catch you later peace <laughs>